It's leaning. Um, I actually much rather listen to Eleanor recite some more poetry, but um, my <laughs> question is for Professor Draper. Um, this last bit you say at the very end, um, I think this is going to hold regardless of whether or not Eleanor's young Christianity is committed to middle knowledge or not. Um, you say, uh, of course, it's logically possible that a God like this has no better way to achieve his goal of forming Israel in that way, uh, but wildly implausible. And my question is, right. um, how are you going to go about assigning the probability distribution here? Um, I thought not just like, you know, in, the, in, this, in the following sense, because I take it her point isn't that, I mean, her point is that, um, first of all, the goal of forming Israel isn't the only goal uh, involved in God's acting in the biblical story and in the story, the way God acts with the Amalekites. Uh, so first of all, they're all there, whatever God's goals is with them. And even if we can give this sort of general account of what God's goal is forming people that are prepared for union with him. I take it that's merely a part, consistent part, but a part of a very long, complicated goal that God has in creation and acting in the world. A story, a goal that I take it as um, traditional accounts, very much beyond our kin. If we start, you know, packing some of that skeptical theism talk into this, I, how do we get that it's, though possible, wildly implausible, that um, this was sort of uh, the best way God could go about doing it? Omnipotence. Oh, you want more? <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to try and assign a specific probability distri distribution. I don't know why you would think I would try to do something like that. Um, but <laughs> yeah, exceedingly remote. Yeah, I got the exceedingly remote line actually from an episode of Star Trek. But um, anyways, uh, data would not say something. Well, that's ex the chances are exceedingly remote. So I thought, Ooh, that's a good line. I'll use that. Um, but... Uh, but no, look, at I mean, imagine, imagine the idea that of an omnipotent being and all the different ways that being could influence, could possibly influence Israel for union with himself, right? I mean, the chances that it would actually have to do something like this, use the, the, uh, the ordering, ordering Israel. I mean, generally speaking, it's not, it's not all that plausible to think that, that that's going to be the best way to to uh, get people to reform by ordering them to commit genocide. Um, now I know, I mean, in fairness to, to Eleanor, she had, a, she had a line about how that might work, but an omnipotent being has so many resources, can, do, can try and influence in so many different ways, affect the person's, you know, and whatever, whatever affects on the person's basic motivational structure, like their, des their desires to do certain things, or their beliefs that influence what they might do, what they might freely choose to do. Those things could be done directly. They don't have to go through this long story of suffering, right? Uh, of, of suffering and, and changing the beliefs and the desires. You could directly change the Israelites' people's desires. Whatever, whatever effect that command and carrying out that command had on their motivational structure, on their beliefs or desires, could be duplicated in another way by an omnipotent pain. So it's really, really, it strikes me, I, I mean, I doubt it's even possible, but even if it is possible, that's why I thought it was so extremely remote. I would, I would like to comment on that. I would like to say that what a Professor just said, Draper just said is, makes my point, and in two ways. Uh -oh. And in two ways. <laughs> I said that unless you watched it in action, you would think we don't need any of this stuff. God could do it by some easier way. Obviously, omnipotence could. That's what he just said. And what I said is, that's what we would believe unless you watched him try out thing after thing after thing and found it to fail. So what I actually said was not that he succeeds by what he does with Samuel and the Amalekites, but that he fails. And as for the last suggestion of Professor Draper's that God could do it by directly acting on the will of a human being, I covered that in my talk, and what I said is, if what you want is union, you can get union only if you've got two wills. If you've got just one will, you don't get union. No, no. So if God puts his will into you, what's in you is his will. Then he can unite with his will, but he can't unite with yours because you haven't got one anymore. No, well, I wasn't denying that there was still free choice, right? Affecting the, the, affecting the strength of your desires or the beliefs that you have, you're, you're, say you're evaluative judgments, they're still then left the free choice to do. In other words, whatever effect commanding the Amalekites to slaughter, I mean, commanding the Israelites to slaughter the Amalekites had, that could be duplicated 
consistent, any effect on their desires or their evaluative judgments could be duplicated, still giving them the free will, so that it's still their own will, so there's still two wills. Um, if you have a teenage daughter and you, and you affect her desires in some limited way and leave her free will, she can still spit in your eye. And if you arrange it so she can't do that anymore, then it's your will in her and not her will. So I would say whichever way you go here, you're going to... That's gonna, a false dichotomy. Yeah, well, okay. Well, this sounds, I'm afraid, I've been ordered by one of the McCallion uh, Trinity members to cut things off. And so we have to thank our speakers. Thank you very much.